We are in Luke 7, but before we dive into Luke 7, let me give us just a little uh, recap of what we talked about last week in Luke chapter 6 as we finished it up. In Luke 6, uh, Jesus gave what we call uh, the Sermon on the Plain, and his main emphasis in that sermon was the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, where he taught us what a citizen of heaven looks like. And so as citizens, in hev- as citizens of heaven, he says of many ways that we are blessed, right? He said, talked about us being blessed when we realize our need for him, that is being spiritually poor. And when we hunger and thirst after his righteousness and living our life the way he wants us to live our life. And, and he said we're blessed when we, when we mourn or when we weep over our sin. And when we weep and mourn over our sin and we repent of that, He forgives us. Praise God for that. Well, we also talked about loving our enemies. Not such an easy thing to do. And honestly, we can't really do it on our own power. We need the Holy Spirit's help to do that. We talked about that last week, how we need his help to help us to love in the pattern of God's love. And many of us know the golden rule. And we talked about the golden rule last week. Uh, and what Jesus said in verse 31 of Luke chapter 6, he said, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do them likewise. And, and so he talked about being kingdom focused and loving others. And even when all these bad things are happening around us, these evil things are happening around us, we are called to do good. And We talked about, at the end of chapter 6, laying a good foundation. He talked about the rock on which you build your foundation. That is on Jesus's, our faith in Jesus and God's word. And that's where we build our foundation. I'm hoping this morning, as we talk about the things that we're going to be talking about, we're going to help build that foundation for us this morning. And so all these things added up together for us to live kingdom lives while on earth. That's what God, Jesus is calling us to do in that, um, in that sermon on the plain. And so as we dive into chapter 7, we see uh, some various or series of events or miracles that Jesus performs and does in his life. We see him this ongoing. And actually, as we begin the chapter, we see Jesus displaying how to love your enemy. And so he was walking the walk. He didn't just have this sermon and then live differently. He lived it out. And so we get to see that unfold as we get to this next chapter in chapter 7. And so before we dive in, let me just take this to the Lord one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we can just go through it uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and get the whole context of your word and, and your ministry, Lord. And we, we just pray uh, and thank you that, that you gave us your word. You gave us this sermon on the plain and, and the Sermon on the Mount that we read about in Matthew, God, and, and we can build our lives upon that. We can see what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And Lord, how to reflect that love to other people, even though they might be our enemies. And God, we thank you that you give us an example of that. And Lord, I just pray that our strength, our, our faith is strengthened this morning. God, in you and our understanding of you, Lord, we, we see that you are who you say you are. We see that your compassion for us, your love for us. And we see that even though you're not moving the way that, that you, we think you should be moving, Lord, that we can still trust you. We can still love you because of your compassion and love for us that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So, Lord, I just pray ultimately that anything of me just falls to the ground. Just let, it, let, let everyone forget it. It does not worth anything. But anything of you, Lord, I just pray that it penetrates the hearts and we leave here more in love with you and more uh, wanting to just share you as we leave here. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's dive in. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. It says, Now when he concluded all his sayings, In the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. And so when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders to the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. And so the beginning of it says he concluded all his sayings. So that is the Sermon on the Plain that we talked about in Luke chapter 6, right? In uh, verses 20 through 49, he gave those sermon. And Jesus, we see he's coming to his city of residence. 
We know from Matthew verse, um, verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, that it says that he came and dwelt in Capernaum. So that he made Capernaum kind of his residence of where he lived. And what's interesting is this means that the location of the Sermon of the Plain that we read about last week, or we finished up last week, is more than likely not that far from Capernaum. And so it says that a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So this centurion, so first of all, a centurion is like a Roman soldier, a Gentile Roman soldier. So, and I'll get out um, to the Jews, right? The Romans were the enemy, right? And so he's ultimately, what we're going to see is Jesus loving his enemy here. And, but this certain centurion that we're talking about, he appears to be a devout kind and, and humble man, yet all the same, uh, not only was he a Gentile, but again, he was a Roman soldier and was the, was the um, instrument of Israel's oppression, right? And so this centurion w- normally would have an attitude, or, or the Roman soldiers would have an attitude where if a servant was sick or ill or whatever, that they would want to just kill him. Just, all right, they're no, they're no good anymore. Yet this centurion, centurion had an unusual attitude toward his servant. It, it was unusual that a master have a close relationship with his servant. The servant uh, in the Roman Empire really didn't have any rights whatsoever. And, and, and it's actually a matter of fact, it, there was a Roman writer who said that, that every year a man should take stock of his possession and should hold on to what is still producing and beneficial and should get rid of everything that which no longer is productive. And that would include getting rid of a servant who was no longer able to do a day's work. And so a slave, if they got to that point, would just be kind of thrown out and left to die. The slave was just a possession to the master. That's essentially what what the Romans used their slaves for. They were just a possession. And under the Roman law, law, actually, he he had every right to kill this servant. And he wouldn't have gotten in trouble for it because it was kind of expected of him to do this, to get rid of him if he couldn't do a day's work. But instead, it says he sent elders to the Jews to Jesus, of the Jews to Jesus, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And so we'll see in the coming verses that this centurion didn't think himself worthy of, of going to Jesus. All right, we'll see that in a minute. But he, and, and perhaps he thought that Jesus wouldn't even want to see him because after all, the Jews and the, and the Romans were enemies and, and perhaps Jesus, this rabbi, wouldn't even want to come and to, to him or anything. And so he sent these Jewish leaders to be representatives for him in front of Jesus, someone that maybe Jesus would respect a little more. And when the Jewish leaders came, they said to the centurion, which is kind of rare, it says, the one for whom he should do this was deserving. And so these Jewish leaders actually looked at this centurion and thought he was deserving. The Jewish leaders did this because he, he was a worthy man. He built them a synagogue. So he built, he built them the house of God, which is kind of cool. He built them a place where they can worship. And he, they said he loved their nation. And so having these credentials, the Jewish leaders came and besought Jesus so that they would come and heal the servant. Now, just kind of a side note. In, in contrast, in Romans 4, 5, it tells us this. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And so what is that saying? We can come to Jesus directly without a representative, even when we're unworthy. Even when we're unworthy, because that verse says he justifies the ungodly. And I praise God for that. But nevertheless, these these considerations suggest that the centurion was what we call a God-fear. And what a God-fear was, was someone, it was a Gentile who embraced Israel's God, but they weren't circumcised, right? The circumcision was the covenant that God made with Abraham and all the Israelites got circumcised. But this uh, Roman soldier, he he loved uh, Israel's God, but he wasn't circumcised. So they called him a God-fear. That's what he would have been considered. And so... Let's keep going and see what happens here in verse 6. It says, Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say, 
to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter my roof. See, he said, he said he's not worthy, like I said earlier. He's not worthy. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy, there it is again, come to, to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And so we see Jesus, even though this Roman soldier might have been his enemy, and, and, and uh, he didn't hesitate. He didn't hesitate to leave with the, the Jewish leaders to go to the centurion's house. And I, I got to say, I kind of wish that the centurion didn't send his friends and Jesus would have gone to the house. It would have been interesting to see if he would have entered in the house. I believe he would. We won't, we won't know because he met, him, he met him before he got there, but I believe he would. Even though it was against the Jewish customs for a, a, a Jewish rabbi like himself to walk into a Gentile's house, it wasn't against God's law. So I believe he would have done it. But before he could get there, the centurion sent his friends to him and said, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy for you uh, that you should enter under my roof. And so the centurion probably knew that there would be a problem for this, this prominent rabbi to come into his home. And so he sent his friends to meet Jesus on the way and just tell him it's not necessary for him to come to his house. And I believe that, that this, this centurion is a, is a remarkable man. Like, uh, looking at his life and who he is and, and, his, and his attitude right here, I, I believe he's very remarkable. He embodies the characteristics of what we just talked about on the Sermon on the Plain, where he's poor in spirit and he's humble. And, and Jesus just preached about that, right? I mean, think about it. The elders, the Jewish elders, looked at this centurion and said, this man is worthy. And he said, I'm, I'm not worthy. They praised him for building a house of God, like the house where they worship. Yet he said, Jesus, you know, I'm not worthy enough for you to come to my house. He, they said that he was deserving. He said he was undeserving. And they recognized, I mean, this centurion, he recognized the need to, for Jesus to do something that he knew he couldn't do. That's the very definition of, of being spiritually poor realizing our need and, and seeking him for that need. This in turn displayed a strong faith and a genuine humility. And I, and I believe those two things, faith and humility, go hand in hand. They are compatible to one another. We clearly see the faith that the centurion had when, when it says, but say the word and my servant will be, your, will be healed. Isn't that amazing? This, this centurion, this Roman soldier, fully understood God's healing power, that it wasn't some magic trick that the magician had to be there to perform. Instead, he knew that Jesus had true authority and could command things to be done and see them completed without even being there. I mean, that's amazing. And so the centurion showed this great faith in Jesus' words and what, he, what his power in his words he understood that Jesus could heal in his words just as, easy as he, easily as he could with his hands, with his touch. And in verse 8, the centurion said something very interesting. He said, for I am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And so he obviously knew the, the military chain of command and how orders uh, were uh, of one in authority were unquestionably um, uh, followed or obeyed. And so why would this centurion say this to Jesus? Was it, was it because uh, he just wanted to show his prominence to Jesus? It was kind of like a pride thing coming out? Well, I don't, I don't think it was because we've already seen he's very humble. He's very, you know, he realizes his need. I think he recognizes that Jesus had authority over sickness. His servant was sick, and even though he had all this authority, he couldn't heal his servant. But Jesus does. He does have the authority. He believed that just as he was a man of authority and is obeyed by his subordinates, that Jesus had the authority over sickness. And he can do it without even being present with his words. Man, this Gentile Roman soldier is, is just displaying some amazing faith, right? And Jesus, in verse 9, he recognizes that faith. It says, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. Jesus marveled at this Gentile Roman soldier. 
(laughs) and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, so he's publicly saying this now about this Gentile Roman soldier, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returned to the house, found the servant well who has been sick. And so it catches my eye that it says Jesus marveled at the centurion. The centurion understood that Jesus' spiritual authority, and, and it made Jesus marvel. His simple confidence in the ability that Jesus to do this with his mere words, to heal, showed that a faith that was free of superstitious um, reliance on some external thing, external thing. This was a great faith that Jesus found worthy of praising, and he, and he made that publicly known that it was a great faith. I mean, did you know that Jesus only marveled on a, on a few occasions? First one, you know, we see it here, that he, the faith of the centurion. He, he, showed, he marveled over the faith of the centurion. And it, but he also marveled at the unbelief of his own people. That, that's what we read about in Mark 6, 6. He marveled at the unbelief. So Jesus can either marvel at our faith or marvel at our unbelief. You know, I, for one, want Jesus to marvel over my faith in him and his ability to do what he says he can do in my life. And so he says to the centurion, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. So Jesus considered this this faith, this Gentile soldier, which, by the way, again, was a symbol of, of their oppression. So in all I get out, it was his enemy. And Jesus considered his faith and thought he was, he was greater than any faith he has seen amongst the people of Israel. That is, amongst the Jews whom Jesus actually came from, right? He, he, he did not see so, as much faith as this Gentile Roman centurion. It's amazing. And then in verse 10, it says, And those who were sent returned to the house and found the servant well who had been sick. And so Jesus both answered the centurion's um, his, his unselfish request and proved that he really did have the authority that the centurion believed that he had. And so that's the first miracle we see in, in chapter 7. Starting in verse 11, we see the second uh, miracle where Jesus comes upon a funeral procession. It says, Now it happened the day, a- the day after, so this is the very next day, uh, he went into the city called Nanan, and many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, had compassion on her, and said to her, do not weep. And so he's leaving Capernaum, and he's going to this place called Nanan. And Nanan is about 25 miles away from Capernaum. So he's traveled about 25 miles, and it says that many of his disciples went with him, and they had a large crowd. So Jesus had this large crowd with him, and we see that the fame and popularity of Jesus is continuing to grow. And he doesn't have just the 12 apostles. He has many disciples with him. And so Jesus comes to the, the gate of this city, and there's a funeral procession happening. Now, if you've ever been to a funeral, you know that any funeral is a tragedy. You know, any, any loss in your life of someone that you care for and special in your life is a tragedy. But this was a special loss. The deceased was the only son of a mother who has already lost her husband. She was already a widow. And in that culture, when you were a widow, it was your sons, it was your family that would take care of you. So this loss was very severe. This this was something that would have, her future, this widow's future would be uh, in trouble, would be miserable. But we also gather from verse 12, that said a large crowd from the city was with her. So Jesus had a large crowd with him, and this, uh, this woman who was mourning had a large crowd. Now, typically, a procession like this would have hired mourners and hired musicians who would come and perform, and, and so kind of help in the process of mourning. And, and when I look at this, and I think, if they are willing to hire people to mourn for, with them and for them, how much more important is it us? to have a community of people around us to help us to mourn when painful situations happen. If you don't have someone in your life that is, is, is just can be with you and mourn with you and be a part of your community, then I just I want to encourage you. You know, look around the room. 
We are believers. We are, we are the, the, the body of Christ. We are here to do exactly that for one another. That's why we have life groups. So we, can, we say we live life uh, together. It's our life together, and we can be there to mourn. And celebrate recovery is the same thing. It's a safe place to be able to share what's, what's causing the pain in your life and be able to find healing. It's so important that we have community. If they're, if they're willing to hire people to do this, how much more important is it for us to have a community of people around us to help us to mourn and be in painful situations? You know, I'll, I'll share my own experience, and probably you've heard this before because I, I just like to brag about God in this way and brag about community in this way. Is um, when my wife and I, between my daughter and my son, we had a miscarriage. And that was probably the most painful, it was, it was the most painful thing that we've ever experienced in our life. And I was probably a year into my sobriety at that point. And it, normally when something painful happened in my life, I would just go right back to drugs. I wouldn't want to think about it, wouldn't feel numb. But this time was completely different. I had a community of people. I was going to a life group we called a small group. And they came to my house. They prayed for us. They helped mourn with us. They did exactly what these people were hired to do for this woman. And it, it was different than any other time that I've ever gone through a painful situation. And it just showed me, God showed me how important it is to have a community of people in your life that can help you in that process and take you to the feet of Christ when those painful things happen in your life. And so I encourage you, again, if you don't have that, then I encourage you to come and find that here at church and just out. Find someone, that, if people that are, are believers to comfort you and help you in that mourning process. And even, even in the joyous things, to help, help, uh, help celebrate with those things with you. It's, it's good to have people around you to celebrate even the good things, right? And so, you know, and, and when I think about this woman in particular, I, I imagine that before her son died, that she was begging. She, I mean, I know I would have been begging God for, for God to save my son. To save, I, I know I would for my son if he was dying. I'd, I'd beg God, God, save my son. And, and, and I would even think, like, after he dies, like, maybe even a little bitter because you, know, you already know I'm a widow and you let my son die. But nevertheless, it says in verse 13, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. He had compassion on her. You know, in the Greek, there's no word that is more expressive of feeling sympathy than the word here that is used for compassion. It is used many times of Jesus. Jesus has compassion on lots and lots of people. He's compassion on us, even today. And it's the strongest Greek word that expresses the, the deepest kind of feeling toward a person. It's that compassion. Jesus had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. And so we're specifically told of the compassion she had, he had for this woman. And he instantly understood the situation and had sympathy on her and giving her hope despite the tragedy of this situation, of this funeral. But I also want you to notice that, that here, that Luke uses the absolute form of Lord. He says, when the Lord saw her. Now, this is the word kairos, all right? And which is, emphasizes Jesus' deity, and so we've already pointed out several ways that, that Jesus uh, referred to as deity here. And this is yet another way that we should say Jesus is God. It, it just points to his deity. And, and next, starting in, chapter, in verse 14, Jesus shows that deity. It's, it's on display when he raises this young man back to life. It says, when he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Then fear came upon all of them, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen up among us, and God has, has visited his people. And this report about him went through all Judea and all the surrounding regions. And so Luke here gives a vivid picture of this open casket or open coffin and Jesus looked at this boy and spoke to him as if he was alive. As if he was alive. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. Jesus spoke to this dead body as if it was alive. Now, in Romans 4, 17, it says this, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. And so Jesus is talking to this dead body as if he was alive. And let me tell you, only God can do that. 
to speak to the dead as if they were alive. And so he spoke to this boy as if he was alive. And then in verse 15, it says, So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother, right? Imagine the mother when Jesus, here's your son back alive. I just imagine the mother, just like her reaction, that the hope restored, the, the um, unbelief is lifted, and the Lord saw her and had compassion on her. Man. And he loved her in a way that only he can. I love this. You know, I look at this, and I think it's an encouragement for us. It's, encourage, it's definitely an encouragement for me, and I hope it's an encouragement for you. That even when the Lord isn't moving the way that we expected him to move, that he's still, he's still there. He still loves us. He still has compassion on us. It probably didn't happen the way the mother wanted it to happen, but Jesus was there. His love and compassion covered her, just like it covers us. And so I hope that's an encouragement to you. And in more than one occasion, actually, Jesus broke up a funeral procession by raising uh, someone back to life. It was true here, but it's also true in the next, next chapter, in Luke chapter 8, we see that Jairus' daughter it gets brought back to life. And of course, we probably all know about Lazarus. Uh, Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. You can read about that in the book of John chapter 11. And interestingly, I, as I was preparing for this message, I came across a, a pastor who was asked to speak at a funeral service. And he was searching the scriptures to find a, a sermon that Jesus gave at a funeral. But his, his search was in vain. Because every funeral that Jesus attended, he rose, he rose the person back to life. So he couldn't find anything. And so it's clear that Jesus doesn't like death, right? He regarded it as an enemy that needs to be conquered, that needs to be defeated. And that's what Jesus ultimately did when he went to the cross and he was resurrected. He defeated death. Now, before we go on, I just want to be clear that this boy was not resurrected. All right? He was what we call uh, resuscitated. And, and there's a difference. You might say, well, what's the difference? Well, resurrection is that you never die again. Jesus, when he was resurrected, he ascended back to heaven. He never died again, right? And God promises that we will be resurrected and rise again to never die again. Where resuscitation, you come back to life only to die again. This poor young man had to die twice, right? So he was resuscitated. He had to die again. But nevertheless, Jesus does this, this amazing miracle and in verse 16, it says, Then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. Now, God has visited his people. We've heard that before. Where have we heard that? Well, we heard that way back in Luke chapter 1, right? Where in the first chapter, at the birth of John the Baptist, and Zacharias, who was John the Baptist's dad, he gets his voice back, and he prophesies. And the first word, some of the first words that he spoke back and all the way back in Luke chapter 1 was, were this. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited his people. So this is a prophecy that Zacharias was speaking. And so here the people are declaring, God has visited his people. Let me tell you, this is a fulfillment of Zacharias' prophecy way back in Luke chapter 1. And I love when I see prophecy fulfilled in Scripture. When I see prophecy fulfilled in Scripture, I know my faith isn't a blind faith. You know, the world wants to say, well, you're just believing this blindly. It's not true. My faith is not a blind faith. It's a faith of substance. It gives me more reason to believe upon Jesus when I see Scripture being fulfilled. And it helps me to build on that foundation on my faith in Jesus Christ and on God's Word. Just like Jesus was talking about at the end of chapter 6, that we build our life on the, on the good rock. And he is our rock. And just, when we hear things like this, I hope it encourages you. I hope it helps you to build that firm foundation on who Jesus is and God's word. But then it says in verse 17, And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding regions. And so not only did it spread in the region where Jesus was going from city to city in, Gal in Galilee, right? It also, it spread, it said, throughout all of Judea. Now, Judea was about 60 to 70 miles away from where this miracle took place. 
So that's a pretty, I mean, they didn't have like Instagram and be like, all right, I'm going to FaceTime. We're, we're going live on this. And none of that, right? This, I mean, that had to be like travel word. Like I'm going to get on my horse and tell the next city. And 60 to 70 miles away, this story came about where Jesus raised this boy back to life. And word spread so much that it got to the ear of John the Baptist, even when he's in prison. And that's what we're going to be talking about in verse 18. He says, then the disciple of John reported to him, disciples of John reported to him uh, concerning all these things. And John called two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? So immediately we kind of see the contrast between this, this faithful Gentile centurion and, this, and John the Baptist who is considered a prophet and is, is sort of his unbelief he has here. But it starts out talking about the disciples of John, all right? And so John the Baptist had his own disciples, and some of Jesus' disciples actually began as John the Baptist's disciples. We know that John and Andrew began with John the Baptist and then went to Jesus. And so John the Baptist's disciples come, or come to Jesus. He's telling them to go to Jesus and ask, are you the coming one or do we look for another? What's interesting about this, if you go to the Gospel of John, that is John the Apostle, not John the Baptist's Gospel, but the, the Gospel of John, it tells us that John the Baptist saw the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus, and so he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. It, it says that, for the Lord told him that upon whomever you see the Spirit of sin, he is the one. And that's what happened. That's what happened right in front of John the Baptist's eyes. So he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And John, in referring to Jesus, he actually points out to his own disciples, and you probably know this saying, it's a famous, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, the one that takes away the sins of the world. And when he did that, he's, he points at his disciples, and that's when John and Andrew actually started following Jesus. But now, now things are a little bit different. John the Baptist is in a dungeon. He's, in Herod's, he's a Herod's prisoner. He doesn't like confined quarters. He's a, he's a man who is in the wilderness. He likes the woods. He likes the outdoors. And, 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 and so he, now he's in this confinement. And no doubt, he, he's not very happy, right? He's, it's irritating to him. And one would imagine that, like, that John, like the other disciples, was anticipating this immediate establishment of the kingdom of God. You know, as a leadership of CCF, we're going through the book of Acts together. And the book of Acts, it starts out in chapter 1 talking about Jesus ascending back to heaven. And right before he do that, the, 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 these disciples, these apostles who have been with Jesus for three years, they ask him, is this the time that you're going to uh, raise the kingdom of Israel? And so even right before he descends to heaven, they still don't get it. And so I imagine that, that John's just like they are and wondering, is probably wondering, how long am I going to have to be in this prison before you, you start reigning, start taking over and take o taking over Rome? And so the question wasn't really, are you the Messiah? It might have been, uh, but it might have been just a question of sort of urging, like, let's get this thing going. What's taking so long? Let's do this. I know you're the Messiah. Get working. Let's do this thing, you know? And, and so... I mean, it could be that the fact that Jesus didn't immediately do that, he didn't immediately, you know, conquer Rome and, and take over things and overthrow Herod, that John did have second thoughts. But either way, I believe John seemed to be offended that Jesus wasn't moving the way that he thought he should be moving. Whatever the case, the response that Jesus gives is actually quite interesting. Let's keep going in verse 20. It says, it says, when the man had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the, the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many with infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. And Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard the, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now it's interesting, the very hour that John the Baptist's uh, disciples come and ask that of Jesus, it says in verse 21, in that very hour they, he cured, speaking of Jesus, cured many infirmities, afflictions, evil spirits, and many blind he gave sight. 
And so this is the real power of the Messiah in action. Yet it was performed in very personable and very humble ways. And it's interesting that most of these miracles that Jesus did fulfilled prophecy. And let me, again, I'm a nerd for prophecy being fulfilled. I love when prophecy is fulfilled. And from the book of Isaiah, uh, the Isaiah in, in chapter 61 says the blind will see. He predicted the Messiah that the blind, that he would heal the blind. In Isaiah 35, it was predicted the Messiah would, that the lame would walk. In Isaiah 35, that the deaf would hear. And uh, Isaiah 26, that the dead would live. In Isaiah 61, the poor would hear the good news. And we're seeing Jesus do all these things. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 11, Believe me that I am the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He said that the works that I do, they testify of me. So he's talking about the Old Testament prophecies testified that the Messiah would be doing these things. It would be a sign that he was the Messiah. Jesus pointed to his works as a testimony for, to his identity and, and he, of who he was. My works bear my witness. I, they testify of me. If you don't believe me, believe me for my works' sake. And so he called upon his works as a witness to his authority and his deity, his idea, identity, that he was God. And they form a very strong witness to his identity and authority, right? Because no man can do these things except the Lord be with him. And Jesus was doing these things. The works that he was doing was the works that was prophesied of the kingdom age. And of course, that's what John was worried about. He was concerned about was the kingdom age, was the, the kingdom. Are you the one? Are you the, are you the one that's going to set up the kingdom? Are you the one or do we need to look for another? And the works that he was doing were the works that fulfilled the king, fulfillment of the kingdom age. Where, it, again, it says in Isaiah that the lame would leap as a deer, the blind would behold the glory of God, the dumb would sing praises unto him, the, and unto the poor the gospel would be, be, be preached, as it, it says in the book of Isaiah. Now, the only one that's not mentioned in Isaiah that Jesus talks about here was healing the lepers. But that's, that's still an amazing miracle that Jesus did. And so... Jesus knew that John the Baptist knew the scriptures. He knew the scriptures well enough when they come back to him and tell John all the things that they saw and all the things that they heard that he would know the scriptures well enough and be like, okay, he's, he's the real deal. He's the, he's the man. We know it. He's the promised one. And so Jesus wanted to assure John and also his disciples that he was indeed the prophesied one that, that the Old Testament and all the prophecies were about. But he didn't do it the way that John the Baptist expected, right? He did it more in humble ways, meaning individual needs, and not a spectacular display of, of political deliverance. And again, I, I love this. I love when prophecy is fulfilled. It gives my faith substance, right? It's not a blind faith, but a faith of what? Substance, right? And I, I hope that you're encouraged by that. Maybe I'm just a nerd and really just really excited about that stuff. But it should excite all of us when we see that because it, it tells us that our faith has substance. It's not just blind like everyone thinks it is. It, it has substance. And it helps us to continue to build on that rock, on our faith in Jesus Christ and his word. And we can, it strengthens those things in our lives. And so let's look at verse 23. And, and we're going to conclude with, with verse 23. It says, and blessed is he who does not offended because of me. This is the last thing he says to send back to John the Baptist. And blessed is he who is not offended of me. Now, I think we have a new beatitude right there, don't we? Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Number one, I think you could say, blessed is he who is not offended, right? I mean, a lot of us need to have a little bit of thicker skin, be able to turn the cheek a little bit, a little bit more often in our lives. I think uh, that is certainly a blessing that is connected of being not so easily offended, but let's go beyond that. Let's go to, to the meat and what really Jesus is trying to say here. Because the end of that verse obviously can't be ignored. That you can't leave off because of me. Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. In other words, is it possible for you to so wrongly anticipate the work of Jesus in your life that you're offended when he doesn't do what you expect him to do? I mean, do you really think that Jesus in your life was to make your life all comfortable, that that, that trial-free life that you've always wanted would be yours? 
I mean, if, if, you, if you believe that, then I just have to tell you that you're wrong. You have the wrong expectations. And blessed are you if you're not offended when you find out who Jesus really is and what he wants to do in your life. You see, I believe that's the trap that John the Baptist fell in. He fell into offense because Jesus wasn't moving the way he thought he was going to move. He thought that Jesus should just already take over Rome and get him out of this prison. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're in this part where like, like, you know, God's not moving the way you want him to move and you're offended because he's not doing what you think he should be doing. But But let me tell you, Jesus tells us that you're blessed when you're not offended when you find out that that's not the case. You see, Jesus is full of promise, like that song we sang this morning. He's full of promise, and he's full of of power for us. But for some of the time, it's very upsetting when we have to be corrected from our own biblical understanding and what we, we think Jesus is like and what he should be doing and come back to who Jesus really is. And blessed are you when you can love him even more when you find out who he really is. When you fall in love with the biblical Jesus, not the imaginary Jesus that you've made up in your mind, but the real Jesus, the Jesus that is really there. Blessed are you when you're not offended. And so that's my encouragement this week, right? That you don't let unbelief into your life. That you don't let that just be offense into your life. Have faith that even when God isn't moving the way that you expect him to move, that maybe school's not going as well as I thought it should. Maybe, maybe you know, life circumstances, maybe I lose power every other day or whatever. Life's not going the way you, way you thought it should. Have faith in him because he still loves you. He still has compassion on you just like we saw uh, with, with the, the widow. He still has the same compassion for each one of us. And even when things are hard, He's going to help you through it and get you through those things and be much easier if you lean on him and trust in him to do it. So let me close in prayer. Lord, I just think that this last, this last verse here is just heavy. It's a heavy passage. And Lord, I pray for those here this evening that maybe there's sometime something going on in their life and they just felt very disappointed in you. Maybe, Lord, they've never even spoken to another person, but that's how it is, Lord. They felt sorely disappointed. And Jesus, I just pray that you would shine the light of your truth and the beauty of who you really are upon those hearts and those minds, that you would just give them this great blessing that they would know who you really are and what you want in their life. Not what we might dream you to be, but who you really are, and that we would embrace that and not be offended because of it. Lord, would you just do that work in our lives? Let us leave here knowing that you have compassion. You have a love for us. Lord, we need you to. So do it for your glory, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.